Out and loud, hallelujah. I'd like to shake hands with two or three persons and say you are welcome in Jesus' name. Jesus is going to bless you today. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Raise up your right hand to the heavens and declare this loud and clear. My father, Baba, me, plug me to the socket of the Holy Ghost today. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and declare it. Plug me into the socket of the Holy Ghost today. In the Plug me into the socket of the Holy Ghost today. In Jesus' name we pray. Now say every part of darkness. Cooking my glory. Don't go, me cannot break. In the name of Jesus. Break the part of darkness. By the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. This next prayer is for everyone here today. Make sure that you pray with aggression. O Lord of God. Arise! Pat my Red Sea. Can I hear the sister saying this this morning? Brothers, shout it louder than the sisters. Uh Everybody shouting it louder. Uh-huh. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Let the rod of God arise and part my red sea. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And declare this louder than anyone around you. Yes, we buy you go when it does Please make sure that nobody's voice overshadows your own now. You will shout this loud and clear. I'll keep the lady long, Rana. Pharaoh of my father's house. Something must happen to you here this morning. The Pharaoh must release that which shall set captive. In 
Jesus name we pray wonderful God we thank you for this wonderful morning accept our thanks in Jesus name the prophecy concerning this morning's meeting is that you will surprise us Lord, I pray that you would lay your hands upon your people in the name of Jesus. And by the time we leave this service, let all the glory belong to you. Let all the blessings belong to us. And all the shame belong to the devil. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. On a day like this, the person needs more than deliverance. It needs overhauling. I don't know whether we're going to finish this thing here today <laughs> or whether we have to continue next time, but I'll see how far we can get because I am going to be very sluggish. Amen. Because I want you to understand everything, so it's important. And so put in Russian when it is not clear. Amen. Many of daddies and mommies at the adult service now, they wished that when they were your age, somebody sat them down and told them what I'm going to tell you now. But they didn't know. And many are full of regrets now. So we're looking at Choosing your life partner. And nobody is too young to listen. Even those who have been married can still listen. Although if you are married, well, congratulations, too late. Uh, <laughs> too late. The only prayer you can pray for you is that God should supply you with iodine, iodine, uh, bandage, first aid equipment to treat it as you go along. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Choosing your life partner. The first point that needs to be made, and very clearly too, which I want you to listen carefully now. That very first point, don't miss it. The first point is this. That the next worst thing after hellfire is bad marriage. What did I say just now? <laughs> That's right. The next worst thing that can happen to a man after hell fire is a bad marriage. That singular decision on who you marry determines the totality of your destiny. They, it would tell us whether you are going to fail or succeed, whether you are going to survive or you are going to sing that singular decision. That's why on wedding days, if you have ever attended a wedding, if you listen carefully to those words that are read to them, they are dangerous words. In fact, those words, I used to call them death sentence. Because they will say, hmm, marriage is not something you just go inside, like a brute that has no brain. Have you ever listened to those things? I'm reading it in modern English for you, but the look, the, the traditional Shakespearean English will tell you something else, but the real interpretation is that this is not something you do without thinking deeply, without working hard, without knowing what to do. That's what they tell them on that wedding day. Unfortunately, many put on the sheepish smile and say, I will. <laughs> he didn't even bother to hear. What did I say? say? I will. A man has just finished fighting with his wife. And somebody was preaching to him outside. Say, said, Mr. Man, better listen to this message. If not, you will go to hellfire. The man said, ah, <laughs> I'm already in one. <laughs> so the next worst thing after hellfire is what? A bad marriage. That singular decision would determine every other thing you do. If 
you are an elephant and you marry an ant. You can't put ant and elephant on the same bed. What will happen? Can an elephant sleep with an ant? Can an elephant have sex with an ant? Because the, he cannot even locate the ant. <laughs> when a cockroach decides to marry a spider, well, they can manage a little bit. Both of them are dark in color, but one of them is, is a night creature. The other one is preparing and producing net in the factory. So they look a bit alike, but it's still a wrong marriage. This is a very serious thing. So the choice of a life partner is one of the most critical choice of your life. Outside your decision to become a Christian, the next decision in your life is your marriage partner. What you become in life is a combination of the choices you make anyway. So once you choose the wrong one, you are in trouble. If you marry a deficit, you marry zero. And what you have before was one. By the time you pay the one back to the zero, you level at zero. If you are zero yourself, and you now marry somebody who is also zero. That is, zero plus zero is equal to zero. Then the children that zero will give back to will be equal to what? Zero. Multiply by whatever. So, outside your salvation, the next most important decision is the choice of who to marry. To marry the wrong person is a disaster and is a tragedy. And the enemy, this way, the devil knows that once he succeeds, imagine the wrong, wrong people together, wrong, wrong people together, the whole world is destroyed. He knows. The devil knows that once two people marry each other and they have a sort of combination that will not allow his kingdom to prosper, he knows that he is in trouble. So he struggles so hard so that people don't make the right choices. And immediately the devil has married you to somebody you are not supposed to marry to. is already playing with your destiny. If you now go and marry somebody who is not born again, an unbeliever, what you've just done to yourself is to make the devil your father-in-law. And the devil is an unkind father-in-law. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. So if you are into a relationship now and you are not really sure whether that's where God wants you to be, the best thing is to pack it up and go and pray again to know whether you are in the right thing or not. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Are you there? It should be very easy to find. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. The decision to find Adam a wife was God's decision. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. Among those animals, serpents, scorpions, tiger, lion, crocodile. Adam, look at the it's crocodile. No. Lion, ah, no. 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 Didn't find anybody among those animals that is help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs. And closed up the rib instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Who brought 
if to Adam, God. And Adam said, this is now the bone of my bones. And flesh of my flesh, he shall be called woman. Meaning, the womb man. Because she said, taken out, because he was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall clip cleave unto his wife. Singular. He didn't say his wives. And they shall be one flesh. And were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Singlehood is bad if not ordained by God. The Bible says, God says it's not good that the man should uh, the man should be alone. These animals can be his companion. And God decided to move on and get a wife for him. Singlehood is bad if it's not ordained by God. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes, you find that after Psalm, after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. Are we there? What does it say? Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. Verse 10, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. 11. Again, if two lie together, then they have it. But how can one be warm alone? 12. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. You see the advantages of having company there. Two are better than one. They will have reward. They can fight a better battle. They can stand very well. They can withstand adversity. They can listen to each other, gain advice from you, gain advice from the other, and then move forward with their lives. Two are better than one. The enemy also knows this one very well. In Proverbs now, go back to Proverbs. Proverbs 18. 18.22. Proverbs is just at the front of the Ecclesiastes we just read. It's important we look at these scriptures very well so that you know how we are going to base our teachings. Proverbs 18.22. Are we there? What did he say? <laughs> Who so find that what? A good thing. And then the person has obtained favor of the Lord. You need favor of God to find your partner. The Lord God Jehovah is the source of marriage, as we have read. He said, Whoso ever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. He didn't say, Whosoever findeth a husband. Why? You're not supposed to be finding a husband. The husband is supposed to be finding you. I'm not supposed to be saying, I'm available. <laughs> no. Because if a man is finding something, it means he's looking for it. And if he's looking for it, when he finds it, he will find it valuable. But if he didn't find it, I'm available. I'm available. I'm available. So how many of you are available here? And the to be say, you, you are too slim. I don't like you. You, your back is too narrow. I don't like you. You, you, you walk like a crab. I don't like you. So you have given him his choice. To be comparing and contrasting. And to be doing random sampling. <laughs> Whosoever findeth a wife find it a good thing and obtain that favor from God. Instead of some men to pray for favor of God, no, they are busy contrasting and comparing, contrasting and comparing, contrasting and comparing. And that is a root of marital failure. When you find a thing, you pray, you work hard to find it, then you value what you found. But if it's offered to you free of charge, then yeah, it has no value at all. 
That's why it is dangerous for you as a woman when at any small provocation you are pulled off your skirt. I say, shall I remove my bra too? It's small provocation. So you just devalue your womanhood and you make yourself so cheap and then you become a cheap woman. Very soon they add your name to their list. This one, one zero. Then, then you become a discussion among men. It's, it's a sad thing, but many people don't understand. I see plenty of people these days, especially overseas. I've seen this in Nigeria too. They have what you call a teddy bear husband. Have this teddy bear there, always hugging. By the side of the bed, they're hugging it. God does not want you to marry teddy bears. Because that teddy bear that you are hugging and hugging and it's not talking back to you. If you think you are going to marry somebody, we will not talk. You are making a mistake. So the choice of a life partner, beloved, is a test. One of the greatest tests you must pass through. It will not have been that difficult if not the devil who doesn't want the right partners to come together. The choice of a partner will have a long, long impact on everything you do. And everything you, and it will have an impact on everything you will become in life. It will either make you or make you. It will determine for you whether you will make heaven or not. If your wife decides, determine that you are not going to heaven, finish, you won't go. (laughs) Yeah. It takes a woman five minutes to scatter a church. Yes, pastor's wife, five minutes. I scattered the church. And I had a friend, a bishop. A bishop in East Lagos. He had a congregation, 1,500. And one day, there was a service like this. Madame went forward and took the microphone. I said, shout hallelujah. Everybody said hallelujah. I said, this man, bishop, that you people are calling bishop there. He said, fornicator. Say fornicator. Say so, he's going to give you communion now. You are going to eat communion from a fornicator. I tell you. Ah, plenty of argument. Say it's not true. Our bishop is not like that. Some say it's true. Some say it's not true. Some say, will you know him better than his wife? Is that not his wife talking? There was an open disagreement. Some people didn't wait for the communion. They went away. By the next Sunday, the 1,000 Bible congregation had become 10. Five minutes, scattered everything. That's why that great apostle, Babalola, who is the father of Pentecostalism in Nigeria, one day he called all his pastors together. He said, How many of you want to make heaven? He says, Sir, I, 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 me, me. How many of you want to make heaven? How many of you want to enter the gate of life? He said, I want to enter, sir. He said, Hmm, ask your wife. Ask your wife. If your wife said, I'm not getting in. Finish. Finish. So that is what will determine whether you make heaven or not. So it's an important decision. Now, I haven't given you that small introduction. I want to give you now 15 wrong reasons for getting married. Some people get married for the wrong wrong reasons. Let's look at these reasons one by one. How many reasons? Fifteen. Wrong reasons for getting married. Number one, you must not get married because of lust. L-U-S-T. Some want to marry only because they want to have sex regularly. That's the reason. That's the idea of marriage is regular sex. Monday, five hours. Tuesday, two hours. Two hours, three hours. There's no other reason. Only. I was in Canada. A Canadian lady came to me and said, I pray for me to get a husband quick. I said, what? I said, I don't want to remain a virgin. I said, I want, I want sex. I mean, that's, what she, that's why she wants to go and get married. Now, when you now get married on the foundation of sex, and you want to be doing one one hour per day or two two hours, and you have a partner who doesn't have that kind of stamina, (laughs) 
then the marriage collapses. Or the man is going outside again, the woman too is going outside again. A lot of what you call love, 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 it is not love at all. The proper word is lost. Lost. And by the time you know it's lost, it's, you are already lost. Marriage is a relationship. And it's not just something out of just lost. Losting after a person. So you must... The one wrong reason to get married is what? Lost. The Bible says part of the problem of the earth is lost of the heart. A lot of people's hearts are dirty with lustful desires, sexual desires, and all kinds of things like that. Two. Second wrong reason for getting married is what the white man calls infatuation. I just infatuated. That is love at first sight. Sudden love. <clears throat> yes, I, I, I just as I saw you like that. <laughs> it's a chemical reaction. <laughs> that took place in my heart. I just knew inside me that the way the chemistry worked is you. Infatuation. Love at first sight. All those kind of sudden love always ends in disaster. Three. Well, another wrong reason for getting married is liking the idea of marriage. Just like it. Who oh, I want to be called Mrs. So and so. I too want to have one woman by my side holding my hand when I walk on the street. So that makes you to ignore the reality of the marriage because you are marrying for the wrong reasons. It's like somebody say, Ah, why do you want to become a soldier? I say, I like the uniform. <laughs> like the uniform. Well, after you have become a soldier and they push uniform on your head and they say, now, somebody is fighting Congo, let's go. I say, ah. I say, does it mean that a bullet could hit me? Yes. Nobody joins the army with the promise that you will not die. Why do you want to become a lawyer? Who oh, you see that gown? And the wig. I like the dream. I like it. Why do you want to marry? Ah, the wedding gown. Ha. Fantastic. My, I, my own. I, although I'm size 14 now, I will guess size 12 so that when they, when they put me inside. <laughs> if that is your reason for getting married, it's a wrong reason. What's the first wrong reason? Two? Three? Just like the idea. Four is the fear of remaining unmarried. The fear of remaining unmarried. When a person is afraid, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, nobody is saying anything to you. Say, hey, hey, hey. So you start getting scared. Say, ha. Is this how they are going to push me aside? Oh, what have I done wrong now? What should I change? What, sh what should I do? That, that fear causes an evil drive that will make the lion to marry the spider. Such people eventually fall in love with the first person that appears to be serious with them. Whereas it's the wrong choice. Because they are just afraid. Whereas the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thy own understanding. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled, but believe in God and believe in me also. The Bible says, the battle is not for the strong, neither is the race for the swift. The fact that they say, get on your marks, get set, go, and you are the first person to take off, doesn't mean you are the one who will win. The fact that you got on the boxing ring, and they say on the red corner you find Ringo Ringo, the, the left corner you find Jigo Jigo, begin to fight, and they give Jigo Jigo a blow, bam, first round, and he fell down, and they can't, one counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
It doesn't, and he stood up. It doesn't mean that because he fell down on the first round, he will lose the fight. So that's why you. <laughs> Amen. So that's why you must not copy people. If you copy people, you stop being an original. You become a photocopy. The Bible says, comparing themselves by themselves, they are not wise. And even our forefathers who never read the Bible, they say fingers are not uh, equal. They are not reading the Bible, but they know that our lives are not the same. So don't start copying on the same. My junior sisters are married. And the ones that were, were, was at the naming ceremony, that one is married. The one that uh, uh, have, have, have become chief bridesmaid for number one, number two, number three, number four. If you are tired of chief bridesmaid, then stop it. Number five is pressure. 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 It's a mistake to just sit down one day without prayer and take your pen and say, by so 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 year, I must have finished this. By December 2011, I must be married. You, you have fixed, you have personally, without consulting the Almighty, fixed a date or stage in your life by which you will be married. And that puts you under terrible pressure. When that date you have fixed in your heart is now getting close, you start getting anxious. From anxiety becomes agitation. From agitation, it becomes panic. Panic. And under panic, <laughs> you now make a mistake because you have married a panic husband. What is the first wrong reason for getting married? Two, three, four, five. Sometimes those pressures may come from your own family people. Your daddy will say, excuse me, when are you bringing a boyfriend here? One will say, excuse me, when are you going to bring somebody here? And they're putting pressure and pressure and pressure on you. I was a teacher in the evening class many years ago. I taught biology in the evening class. The evening class is an interesting place to teach because uh, at least the, in that class where I was teaching, everybody on the front row could be my father. We call it adult education. Everybody on the front row. Yes. Could my father. But one of us was a young, how a young girl came to that class, I didn't understand. I didn't know they were putting her under pressure at all. I, I didn't know the parents were harassing her, they were pressurizing her. They, they took away her school fees, they took away her class, they said, go and marry. And she was a child of God. She was born again. She said, well, if, you, if because you are sponsoring me to school, you are trying to pressurize me to marry, I will go to adult education class, which I can afford. So she was going to these cheap evening classes, subsidized by government. I was, I was surprised what she was doing there. One day, I was in class. And a woman came, very thick, Lagos madam. And she said, come. I was teaching her class. She, was, she approached at the back of the class and said, you, come. I said, okay. So, <laughs> I left my teaching. I went to her. I said, that girl over there. I said, yes. I said, she's my daughter. I said, yes. Are you the teacher? I said, yes. I teach biology. I said, okay. I said, do you know why she's in this class? I said, no. I used to wonder. I said, well, it's because she's disobedient. So, I want you to stop her from coming to this class. That's why I'm here. And I called the sister. So what's the matter? That one I explained to me. That, ah, and uh, they, they said, when am I going to bring a sugar daddy home? When am I going to bring this person home? And I said, I'm not ready yet. I want to pray. I'm a child of God. And this and that and that. And the woman said, she turned to me. I said, you see the foolish thing she said? You see the foolish thing she said? She didn't know who I was. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So when the woman has finished, I can say, Madam, will it have been nice for this lady to come up with a pregnancy 
that has no father. Wouldn't it be nice for you to just go into the street and sleep with all kinds of men around and then mess your name and the name of your family up? Now look at myself. Are you part of them? <laughs> say, hey, this world. Ah, he is handsome man. You have joined this issue. Hey, hey. So, pressure should not make you to lose focus. Six. Escaping from being jilted. Escaping from being jilted. That is, you were with somebody. The person has jilted you. So, another person has now come. So, because you, you fear being jilted, quickly you rush into marriage with that one. It's a wrong reason to marry. Many of the, I was jilted, I was jilted. In fact, whenever I see people who are jilted, I congratulate them. I said, because if he's a proper man, if he's your husband, he will not jilt you. Old Jabba Road, 1993. <laughs> a lady wants to marry. A week to the wedding, the man showed up and said, no, I am no longer interested. The, the wedding gun has been done, everything has been done. I'm no longer interested. The, you, know, you know the way they pack uh, dirty clothes from the floor? That's how they pack the lady to me at the counseling room. It was like jelly. And, so, and she was saying, let me die. Let me die. Dr. Lukoya, let me die. I said, why do you want to die? He said, the man has just jilted me. I said, but... Uh, God can open a fresh door to you. I said, Dr. Lukoya, you don't understand. <laughs> so, the worst thing was that the man ran away with the chief bridesmaid. And it was the chief bridesmaid of this lady the man eventually married. So, I, I consoled her, prayed for her, and so on and so forth. Two weeks after the wedding to the chief bridesmaid, they were both traveling to Sowa in Shagamu. They had an accident. The two died. That quickly shook the sister out of his out of her shock. <laughs> that sister is married to one of our pastors now. Amen. Anytime I see her, because the husband is now abroad, I will say, "Hey, Doctor Lukoya, let me." <laughs> Shout hallelujah. If God allowed you to die now, will you be here? The seventh wrong reason for getting married is for you getting married for money. Money. Money does not guarantee success in marriage. Money does not buy happiness. Money can buy you spectacles, but it cannot buy your eyes. Money can buy you bed, but it cannot buy you sleep. Money can buy you the pews in the church. You can buy pews in the church, a special seat for you in the church, but it cannot buy you salvation. Money can buy you plenty of textbooks, but it cannot buy brain. Money can buy you plenty of food that tantalizes and sweet sensation, but it cannot buy the appetite. So there are plenty of things money cannot buy. Money cannot buy happiness. Unfortunately for the sisters, many of the extra, extra nice men are not rich. <laughs> Unfortunately. And many sisters who say, well, uh, I just uh, I just just want to marry anybody. I want to marry somebody who will carry my load. Which load? <laughs> no, I, I'm looking for somebody. Oh, I want to be pampered. Looking for somebody who's going to look after me. <laughs> In this campus. <laughs> well, I was a lady in our class when we were studying here. 
the lady used to say, I must marry a pilot. I must marry a pilot. At whatever cost, I must marry a pilot. Yeah, she married a pilot. She's married to a pilot, but the last time I saw her, all the front teeth were gone. And she had only one good eye. Because this pilot had been using her as a punching bag. Money. Don't, when you're going to marry a person, don't look for money. It's not money. Money. A lot of people are looking for comfort. Money. No, 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 no. You must have a fast car. You must have a big car. You must do this. You must do that. That fellow without a car may be able to buy 200 tomorrow. Amen. But that is not an excuse. <laughs> it's not an excuse for you, a man, to swallow the sweet of poverty of your father's house. Amen. Number eight. A person is marrying for the wrong reason if you are using that marriage as an escape route. An escape route. Say, I'm tired of my daddy and my mommy. I must get out. I want to escape from this problem in the house. I woke up in the morning. I'm the one who will sweep. I'm the one who will cook for them. I'm the one who will do this. The one who will do that. No, 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 no. I can't go on like this. If I'm, if I'm married now, they can't drag me from my husband's house to come and be washing plates. No, 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 no. I must go. I must leave home. I can't stand my daddy. I can't stand my parents. I can't stand my mother. So you left because you use it as an escape route. And when it's an escape route, it's because some people are lonely and they're unhappy. They're motivated to leave. Sooner or later, they face the same problems they're trying to run away from. Sometimes, it's like jumping from fry pan into the fire. Into the fire. At least your father will not bring somebody home to come and compete with you. But the man can bring a woman home to come and compete with you. How many things have I told you now? Eight. Eight. What's the first one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The night long reason for getting married. Is having pity. You feel sorry for the man or woman. Say, hey, somebody is punishing this man like this. Hmm. The man said, uh, you see, I'm a divorcee. My first wife broke my head. Second wife broke my leg. Third wife broke my back. So I'm looking for somebody who will pity me. Say, oh, oh, sorry. 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 Say, Can you marry me then? <laughs> These people have treated me. Say, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, Pele. Sorry. Biko. You don't marry out of what? Pity. Pity. And I used to think in the past that it's only the woman, because there are some people I call Sister Pure Water. Sister Pure Water, I just, any smart thing, start crying. Okay. <laughs> I call them sister what? Water. I used to think it's only the sisters who do Jeremiah. But I've seen men. Oh. I see some men crying like babies. Even pastors. Yeah. One day they took a pastor. They transferred him from one place to the other. And the man came to complain to me. The pastor is a very fat man. Oh, I've never seen a fat man crying like that. <laughs> He cried and his body was vibrating. Joe, you are our father. You can't sit around like this and let them move me from a congregation of 2,000 to 300. This is unfair. <laughs> Unfortunately, only few women can stand men crying. Only few. I tell a man breaks out and cries like you say, sorry, this is the way you're making me cry. (laughs) 
So you don't marry out of pity. Ten. Another wrong reason to marry is foolish expectations. Very foolish expectation. You are marrying an unbeliever and you are believing that you will get born again. It's, it's your own key of salvation in your own hand. Were you the one that made yourself born again? It's a foolish expectation. You see a man who is smoking in their hemp. And you say, well, since I met him, he has reduced it. He was, speaking, he was, he was smoking 10 weeds by day. Now he has reduced it to two. I'm sure by God's grace, he will change. Ha! Huh? <laughs> If they don't change before you marry them, you are in trouble. Many a person, you, you've met a man, you can see that even as a young man, the temper is terrible. And you are hoping that when you marry him, he will change. No. He's probably going to increase. So, foolish expectations will cause trouble. Foolish expectations. They will change. You know, they never do. Eleven. Wrong. Another wrong reason for getting married is beauty or handsomeness. Beauty or handsomeness. Like I told you last week, to marry a man or a woman because of beauty and handsomeness is to buy a house because of the paint. Once the paint wears off, then you see. The best time to look at a woman properly is when she's just waking up. Not under the makeups. Makeup, the, the person who designed the name makeup did a very good definition. Makeup, that is, is not up to standard. You are making it up. But women who get their beauty from the Lord don't need to make up nothing. nothing. Let that man see you as you are now. Because when you're now getting and all the paint and the panel beating and spraying has been removed, and you say, Hey, Lord of Jesus, this is what you look like. Number 12 reason for getting married is accidental pregnancy. Because you got pregnant mistakenly doesn't mean that you now have to bury your life into that marriage. Well, you've made a mistake, you've had a child of fornication, which the Bible also defined as a bastard, but then, <laughs> but then that doesn't mean you should bury your destiny there. Is the wrong reason to get married. Thirteen, tribal connection. I must marry somebody from our town. Not only our town, our village. Not only our village, our clan. Tribal connection. Fourteen, another wrong reason for getting married is just to satisfy parental, to, just to satisfy your parent, parental satisfaction. Satisfy them. You marry the friend of your daddy because your daddy is a marry. You are satisfying them while hurting your destiny. And the last wrong reason to get married is in order to hurt your parents. So people get married in order to just get at their parents and hurt them. Yes. How many reasons have I told you now? Let's hear them one by one. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, number fifteen.
Those are the wrong reasons for getting married. Wrong reasons for getting married. The Bible gives us why marriage is created. It's for companionship. We have a companion. It's for procreation to have children. And it's to, it's to fulfill the agenda of God for your life. I want you to understand this very well. There are only two kinds of husbands. And there are only two kinds of wives. You have the wicked husband. You have the godly husband. The choice is yours. Two kinds of husbands. The wicked husband. And which one again? Godly husband. Or some people call it kingdom husband. There are different categories of wicked husband. <laughs> So better understand it very well. Different categories. I'm, I'm going to wicked wives too. Let's, let's look at the wicked husbands. Number one wicked husband is the husband we call the hard husband. Hard. Unbending. Unyielding. It cannot be corrected. He knows everything. It cannot be cancelled. It's arrogant and stubborn. It will warn your parents not to come to the house. It will beat up your mommy. He has no fear. No honor, no respect. I'm very, very difficult to live with. The hard word, hard husband. A woman came to me crying some time ago. I said, Joe, please, whether it's against your regulation here, or not, I must run away from this house. This is, this is, this is terrible. I can't stay here anymore. I said, go and bring the man. I brought the man. The man does not come to mention of fire. The wife comes. I said, madam, why, why are you harassing her? The man said, I don't harass. I don't harass. I'm just checking her out. <laughs> so, what do you mean you are checking her out? Madam said, this madam, this woman works as a bank manager. Anytime she comes home from work, the first thing the man asked was, remove your pant. She, she will not take her pant and begin to smell it to confirm whether the woman has been sleeping around. What kind of husband is that one? Amen. <laughs> you get home from work, it's not darling welcome, say, remove your pant. The hard husband. That's the second kind of husband again. We call it the mini husband. Mini. Mini husband. Fake husbands. They perform very, very well on the bed and at dining table. But when you say, come and pay school fees, I don't have. <laughs> come and provide for the family. It's not available. Some of them are too lazy to walk. And some of them spend the money on strange women outside. We call them mini husbands. Then, three, there is a bachelor husband. Bachelor husband. That one has separated his room from his wife. He's a single married man. Very, very selfish. Self-centered. He would take his phone and talk to his friend for hours. But the wife that is sitting at home, no talk. He's still a bachelor. He just got married. Four. That is acidic husband. Very hot-tempered. A boxer. A wrestler. Abusive. Shouting. Sit down. Shut up. Come here. No laughing. No fun. No joke. No nonsense. Very serious. No play. He barks at everybody like a sergeant major at the world from. I said, come and see my hair. His house is like a military camp. And he's a lion in the house. 
and can slap anyone at any time, including mommy or house maid or anybody. Some of your parents are like that. Some of you understand what I'm saying now. That's number five. That's the slave master husband. Slave master. That one, women should be seen and not heard. The woman is a cook, a dry cleaner, a sex machine, a baby making factory. Period. That's all. They see the wife as housemaid. It's like that, my friend, many years ago. Four weeks before his wedding, he stopped washing his clothes. He was just piling them up, piling them up, piling them up. I said, brother, ah, you are not washing your clothes. I said, sister is coming. <laughs> it's coming. So his, his idea of a wife is a dry cleaner. This kind of man, the slave master's husband, his own junior sisters, junior brothers who are living with him, they are above his wife. And then, if the woman is unfortunate and fails to give birth to a boy, ah, problem. Serious problem. There is this kind of wicked husband. We call them general husband. <laughs> he has chains of girlfriends and concubines and strange women. He spends lavishly on them. He goes to prostitutes and concubines. Anything is kept, he runs after them. Even they sleep with their housemaid. And they'll be running after their wife's younger sisters. Oh, yes. We call them general. Seven. <laughs> so, sisters, I'm telling you, so you know how to pray. I'm telling you the different kinds that are available on the market. <laughs> so, so, when you start shopping, you know which supermarket to go to. <laughs> That is number seven, the dry husband. Very dry. No closeness to the wife. No kissing, kissing her. No. No love, no romance, no intimacy. The wife must knock before he enters his bedroom. If you didn't like say, go out and knock. When I say come in, then you come in. You cannot easily talk to him. It's difficult to talk to. They have, they have little or no respect for their wives. They are abusing their wives in the presence of visitors and strangers. Say, so foolish woman, is, this, is that how to give water to the visitor? Is this that? What kind of food is this? And if the wife says, Excuse me, can I go and visit my friend? I've been in this place where I say, if you, if you step out of this place, make sure you don't step back. Eight. That is Panadol husband. <laughs> Panadol husband is just exploiting his wife to solve his own problems. Say, madam, uh, your husband needs uh, 5,000 naira. I want to buy Maltex. Maltex, Maltina. <laughs> Madam, I want to pay school fees of my junior brother. Can you withdraw money when you are coming from work? I want to pay. So, he's it, 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 exploiting the woman. Overseas, they go and marry a woman who is a citizen in order to get paper and work permit. They are Panadol experts. They use the wife as medication. And immediately they are okay, they get what they want, they stop loving the woman. They are basically exploiters. 
There are people like that. They will use in, in, they will know this Nigerian woman has belonged in England and she's now gotten a stay resident permit for America. She's gotten a green card. They'll say, okay, uh, I want to marry you. I love you. Whatever is a lie. All she wanted is for her to file for her to get his own permit. Immediately that permit comes, he jumps out. We call them Panador. Husband. Just looking for something to quench his headache. Number nine. Parasite husband. The parasite husband will not work. Does practically nothing at home. Fold his two legs up and watch his CNN. Go to the kitchen, wash place, abomination. Wash madame's clothes, no way. Men don't wash clothes. Clean the toilet, no way, but it can, it can spoil the place. Then, lastly, we have baby husbands. These are basically infant men. They are infants spiritually, mentally, and character-wise. Age has nothing to do with baby husbands. When you marry a baby to your husband, you have married somebody, you need to be changing his nappy. You need to be that. A baby husband beats the wife. A baby husband rejects food because he's angry. He's hungry, but he's angry. A baby husband will never assist anybody in domestic work. A baby husband does not have I am sorry in his vocabulary. A baby husband can never be influenced by his wife. A baby husband is a nagging husband. Who talk, 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 talk. And the woman will say, please, you have been talking for one hour. Can I sleep? He said, no, you must remain awake. You must listen. A baby husband keeps malice with his wife. Three weeks. Won't talk to her. Won't talk to her. They don't pray. They don't, they don't talk. They just enter. They, they, they are sleeping on the same bed, but they are not talking. The man lies on the bed, faces the wall. The woman faces the other side. A baby husband threatens to push out his wife at smallest provocation. He says, I will marry somebody else. And you will see. A baby husband compares his wife with former girlfriends, another woman. So you're a very, very boring, dull woman. Okay. Boy. A baby husband does not know what they call romance. All he wants is sex. A baby husband never does anything to improve his marriage. He doesn't read books. He doesn't attend seminars. He doesn't read the Bible. He's not interested in marriage seminars. The only seminar is interested in hundred reasons, hundred ways to become a millionaire. <laughs> a baby husband will always retaliate. If, if anything the wife does wrong, there is no forgiveness, he will retaliate. A baby husband, nobody can know his whereabouts. You call him, he's in London, he will say, I'm in Ikeja. A baby husband does not love the wife, but will be pretending to love the woman. He never prays with the wife, doesn't even pray with the family. He embarrasses his wife publicly. Those are baby husbands. There are plenty of them around, including those old men in church. Many of them are pure baby husbands with feeding bottle and nappy. <laughs> A baby husband reports his wife to third parties. Every time the tenants will come, ha. Open this door. Don't kill her. <laughs> Don't kill her. Open the door. Open the door. A baby husband who always invite his own daddy, his own mommy to come and be settling quarrel in the house. Always third party. A baby husband will call the wife horrible names. Salamander. Cockroach. Foolish woman. A baby husband threatens to react if there is no male child. Whereas, this is simple genetics. You need two chromosomes to become a woman. You need two chromosomes to become a man. X, X is woman. X, 
Y is man. Women can only donate X. They don't have any Y to donate. It's the man who should donate the Y. But the man who is supposed to donate the Y is donating X, X, and is fighting. A baby husband loves his mother more than his wife. In fact, when the mother comes to visit, the wife vacates the bed. And I've seen a husband and the mother combining to beat the wife before. I've seen that one before. Baby husband. A baby husband will say, well, uh, I, don't, I don't believe you. You are cheating me. So instead of him to put money for food, give it to madam, he will go to market himself. I'm going to say, how much is this meat? I want pepper there. I want this there. I want this there. And trust those mamas in the market. Say, oh God. <laughs> you don't have wife. Why are you doing here? <laughs> a baby husband will be confiding in his parents instead of his wife. And a baby husband is extremely critical. Huh? Critical. By the time they finish with the woman, you think she's nobody. You criticize her, the woman will lose self esteem because she's, she'll be criticized out of focus. I went to somewhere like that. They called me, they are fighting, oh, hey, please, Joe, come. Oh. That was well, 1989 when we started MFM. So I, I now rushed to this place and I saw the man. This man was a pauper. When he began to come for a meeting, he prayed some prayers, God began to bless him. So I went there and said, ah, uh, they said the man was a pirate before. I said, okay. You've married the pirate. God will help you so that your life will not be pirated. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got there. And the man was complaining. What kind of woman is this? I mean, she's too dirty. I don't want to marry a dirty woman like this. Say, for example, come, 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 come. And I followed him. He brought out a stick. And he was using the stick to bring out the woman's pant from the cupboard. And he was advertising them to me one by one. See, see this pant? This pant? And, and let me be honest. Those pants were really dirty. <laughs> Amen. But I noticed that as he was bringing out the pants one by one. He was using the same stick to push some other pants inside. And I said, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. That one you are pushing, sir. Can you bring it out? So, he was bringing out the one of his wife. He was pushing his own inside. And his own was worse. A baby husband destroys the wife's property. Any small quarrel. So you are the one who bought this television, who carry the television, slam it on the floor. Baby husband. A baby husband will be asking for very strange sexual positions. Say, behave like a dog. Behave like a serpent. Put your leg on the chair. Put your back on the floor. Put your leg here. The poor woman will say, Ha! Ah, he's telling me. Say, so, like, look again. I don't know why you are. A baby husband does not offer apologies. Doesn't apologize to nobody. What is apology? It's not in his dictionary. A baby husband is always going to the hometown. Weekend is off. He leaves the family and the wife in Lagos. Some time ago, (laughs) 
This lady brought one man to me and said, I want to marry the man. But as they were moving close, I was hearing reggae music. I said, ah. So I asked her to go out. I asked the man to go out because I didn't know the man. It's the woman and I said, who is this man? I said, I want to marry him. And I've gone to the mountain to pray. I said, ah. Sister, go and pray again. And anytime you hear a man of God telling you, go and pray again. What he's telling you is no way. He's telling you there's no way there. What is praying again? So go and pray again. You say you have prayed. Loud music. She went and said she prayed. Then she had a revelation. God, God is very God is very merciful. She had a revelation. She found themselves in the wedding ceremony in church. And that this husband that is taller than her, and in that revelation, the husband had become a pygmy. So, and she's a tall woman too. So while the pastor was married, joining them together, he was holding his hand like this. <laughs> say, say, what does that mean? Say, why, does he, why did he become a pygmy like that? And I'm so t- tall. I said, it's because he's a baby husband. You want to marry. Right now, the marriage has scattered. But not before the man gave, gave her mother serious beating. Mother-in-law. Serious beating. <laughs> not before, when the sister was pregnant, the sister was pregnant, immediately the sister got pregnant, the man started going out every day. Doesn't, didn't sleep in the house again. So one day, so the, the, this pregnant woman now stood at the, at the front of the car and said, you are not going out. Ah, you left me here every day. Nobody to talk to. You can't go out. The man said, leave the front of that car. Leave the front of that car. She didn't answer. You know, he drove off. And the pregnant woman came on the bonnet, fell on the floor. Then he reversed. Put her in the car, took her to the hospital. Our time is up. Stand up. <laughs> we'll continue next week. It's past 12. <laughs> 10 minutes more. Okay. Let me continue a little bit further. <laughs> you can only marry two kinds of wives. The godly wife and the wicked wife. Or kingdom wife. And when you talk about wicked wives, there are various categories. Number one, you have the dictionary wife. You know, the dictionary is a book that does not welcome your opinion. What is bat? A bat is an animal, period. Whatever you say, does not matter again. A dictionary wife is a wife that does not welcome other people's opinion. She's right and she wants to do what she wants to do. Finish. Two, you can marry a boxing partner wife. No submission. Contest for leadership. Say, so the, so I'm the head here. Say, so which head? head? Head of fowl. The boxing partner wife will have timetable uh, uh, sweeping on Monday. Honey, my dear, cooking on Tuesday, my dear. So, timetable. If you do timetable, put it on the wall. So, if, if you don't sweep, when you should sweep, demand. <laughs> don't cook, when you should cook, that will be fight. You see, the, a, a, a boxing partner wife sees the husband as a rival. Was fighting and proving the point. Said, "Look, look, look, look! I, I, I had a master in English language. You got, you got a H N D in geography. What did you call it? And you can't talk to me anyhow." 
Three. You have the headmaster's wife. She's richer than the husband by design or whatever. But very proud. Very arrogant. Very stubborn. And she combines her financial power with all kinds of powers to disobey and to cause trouble in the home. There are plenty of wives like that. Four, there is a party wives. Only pleasure. Weekend, she, Friday night, Saturday night, she will never be at home. She's gone. Highly social. Calling her all over the place. We have this ones too. Then, number five, we have the pampered wives. She's not used to anything hard. She expects to be treated like a leprosy patient. She expects the level of treatment she gets from her father's house. Don't talk to her anyhow. She will break down and you may have to admit her in the hospital. So she is very, very sophisticated, very fragile. And you have to be very, very careful. If not, she will, she will threaten to kill herself and she will begin to swallow rat poison. Your presence. Six. You have the dustbin wife. Extremely dirty and disorganized. When you get to the city room, it's like a toilet. The kitchen becomes an empire of rats. Clothes are unwashed and things are left to be dirty. We have those kind of wives. Seven, we have the ADC wives, AD camp. They have zero tolerance for other women close to their husband. Zero tolerance. Don't want to see anybody beside you. I'm your wife and don't shake anybody. Don't smile at them. Don't wink. If you wink, trouble. So, this is why these days now, a lot of sisters don't want to marry pastors. They say, ah, pastor. Too many women gravitating towards them. No. No, somebody is private. It's an ADC wife. They are hostile to any woman close to their husband. And sometimes they police that husband. Like detective. Over the place. If the man is going to the toilet. Eight, there is the acidic wife. Always ready to fight. Keeping malice and being moody for days. Acidic mouth. When she talks, you feel like committing suicide. Then there is the office wife. They just pursue their jobs, their career. Every other thing is secondary. And all functions in the house handed to handmaids, housemaid, everybody. She doesn't do anything. Just interested in her career. They are office wives or career wives. Plenty of them are not interested in what happens to you in the house. Ten, there is a grandmother's wife. She's completely, she's completely ancient in thoughts, outlook, and behavior. If you say, go and wear pajamas, wear night dresses, say, no, I must wear my rapper because of spirit husband. She wears her pants to bed because of sweet husband. Very careless and disgusting dresses. Ah, hey, don't, don't, don't kiss me. It, they say it will cause asthma. Then hey, put off the light. It is, it, is, it is abomination to sleep when there is light on. It must be dark. It must be dark. Ah, no, 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 no. Ah, don't, no sex in the afternoon because uh, the, the, the child will become an albino. Rise up on your feet, rise up on your feet. Rise up on your feet. Now, say this with a loud voice. Where others are feeling. Up 
Will your mouth and declare it? Aha, 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 In Jesus' name we pray. You, that person there, you have your mother at home, they say your mother has a terrible disease. When you leave this meeting now, don't go anywhere. Just go straight to that your mother and lay your hands upon her and she'll be made whole. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Father, I'm praying for this person over there who have been suffering from this strange fever, strange migraine. The hand of the enemy upon your ear that the enemy has been using to manipulate your health. Let that hand be shaken off your head now. In the name of Jesus. Yes, that's the person over there. The hand of God is coming upon you. Now say this loud and clear. Every power assigned to waste my destiny be wasted in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and declare it.